As a young child in Mashita, Tokyo, Satoshi Tajiri loved bugs. He grew up in a more rural area where he could hunt bugs to add to his insect collection. He wanted to be an entomologist and his classmates even called him Dr. Bug. This love of hunting insects would inspire Satoshi to create Pokemon. Now the franchise has become unbelievably successful, but none of the games felt like you were actually hunting for Pokemon really. Instead, players were just wandering around in grass and caves for a random encounter. Fans have been clamored for an open world Pokemon game, one that could possibly truly reflect the experiences that Satoshi Tajiri had in his youth. And at the end of 2022, we got Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and it seemed like technology finally caught up with fans' dreams. But did it really? Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. If you include alternate versions and videos lost to the internet, I think I've completed more Pokemon games than Legend of Zelda games. Seriously. This series has kept me busy with crushing evil teams, conquering difficult battle towers, and most importantly, catching them all. If you listened to the Poke Rap as many times as I did growing up, that last one is definitely embedded into your brain. And after over a quarter of a century, Jesus, I'm old, we finally entered the ninth generation of Pokemon with Scarlet and Violet. I'm giving Scarlet and Violet my completionist rating of Finish It. As the first truly open world Pokemon game, there's a lot to love here. Tons of cool new Pokemon, a great region to explore, and some of the hottest characters in the entire franchise. Seriously, have you seen these professors? Why do this? This is a game for everyone, including parents and thirst traps, apparently. Scarlet and Violet also has one of the most fascinating stories I've ever seen in the Pokemon franchise. It feels deeply personal to the characters and also compels you to check out every part of the Paldea region. But all of this is hampered by a ton of technical issues that test even the most passionate Pokemaniacs. My vibe is still positive overall. They just could have used some more time to work out the kinks. Just like how most players could work out their own kinks when they met Rika. Oriono, or Sigario, or Larry. Yes! All glory goes to the winner! Look, I'm not going to explain what Pokemon is to you. I've already completed plenty of Pokemon games and the franchise has been around for well over 20 years at this point. I even argue Pikachu is more recognizable than Mickey Mouse. So I'm going to assume that you know about the history of the Pokemon franchise. For those few people who don't know what a Pokemon game is, it's a basic and charming RPG where your main goal is to defeat the Pokemon League, become the Pokemon League champion, and catch every single Pokemon in the game. At least that's what they want from the player. What I do find interesting is Pokemon's recent history, especially since the last generation of games was a big one. Not only did we see the release of Sword and Shield in 2019, but we also got a pair of DLC expansions. We got remakes of Diamond and Pearl and Pokemon Legends Arceus, Game Freak's most ambitious game at the time. And that's even without mentioning spin-off games like New Pokemon Snap and Pokemon Masters EX. It's been a few busy years for Pokemon in general. However, with that kind of activity comes a certain amount of expected and probably warranted scrutiny. Reception may have been positive overall, but people were quick to jump on things that weren't working, mostly regarding the graphics and performance issues in the main games of Sword and Shield, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, and more recently, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Wandering Pokemon would just pop in from the distance and the frame rates would drop so they looked more like bad GIFs than animations in a video game. Textures used for some trees and other scenery were more reminiscent of something like Ocarina of Time than Breath of the Wild. This wasn't something that really bothered me personally, but you couldn't help but notice how bad it was. Fortunately, Game Freak listened to the fans and made some changes before they even released Scarlet and Violet. <laughs> 
just kidding. No, Scarlet and Violet released and there were all of those issues. They were worse, a lot worse. There were massive glitches. The game would crash. The slowdown effect felt like you were underwater. The Pokemon company even added salt to the wound by barely acknowledging that there were any problems at all. All of this led to Scarlet and Violet being the worst reviewed mainline Pokemon games ever by fans and critics. When a game gets this much negativity, it usually reflects in the game's sales. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. This is Pokemon, baby. Scarlet and Violet sold 10 million copies in the first three days of its release, making it not only the fastest selling Pokemon game, but the most profitable launch of any console exclusive game ever. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet separates itself from previous entries by having a complete open world setting. Yes, Sword and Shield had the wild area and Pokemon Legends Arceus was made of separate areas you could explore at will, similar to Monster Hunter. But Scarlet and Violet are the real deal. You can go just about anywhere and take on most challenges after about the first hour of the game. Scarlet and Violet also separates themselves from other Pokemon games by having three concurrent storylines. You start off at the Yuva or Naranja Academy, depending on your version, where you get to decide which order you handle the storylines. The first is Victory Road, which should sound familiar to anyone who's played a Pokemon game before. Get eight gym badges, beat the Elite Four, easy peasy. Second is the Path of Legends, where you help your classmate Arvin defeat five Pokemon Titan. And the third is Starfall Street, where you help the mysterious Cassiopeia dissolve the organization known as Team Star, Scarlet and Violet's evil team. Once again, just beat the five team leaders and you're all set. Even though this sounds like a lot more to do than in your typical Pokemon game with 18 challenges instead of eight, I wasn't that worried. The main story is always the easiest part. What made me a bit more nervous was the large amount of collectibles. There's an abundance of TMs, sandwich recipes, and random stakes in the ground that you'll have to grab, and a lot of them are not available until the post game. Then, there was the most important collectible of them all, the actual Pokemon. Now, Scarlet and Violet are limited to 400 currently, but there's a lot of pocket monsters to search for, train, and evolve. So, this time, I decided to do things differently to liven things up and make it easier for myself. I chose to not go to school and start any of these three campaigns until I had completed the Pokédex. Not only that, but it had to be a living Dex, a physical Pokémon in my boxes for every entry. Is this the right way to complete the game? God no! But there is no God! Only Gerard. This is my house! And in my house you catch them all! From your fans who help you out and build your community, you get them all! Ever since Pokemon debuted, the goal of the series was made crystal clear in all of their advertising and shows. Gotta catch them all! Get out there and collect every single one of these creatures that could destroy an entire city if they felt so inclined. In just about every main Pokemon game, catching every single Pokemon was the main goal of the post game. And with all the reports about how janky Scarlet and Violet were, personally speaking, I was going to skip this generation entirely. This is one of the few times where public sentiment really pushed me away from not playing this game at all. Completing the Pokedex may not necessarily be difficult, especially for me, but it is time consuming. That's one of the reasons you used to see me complete these games with a group of guests. Not only could they shoulder off some of the completion burden from my shoulders, but I also like playing these games with friends. Comparing teams, battling, and trading Pokemon is all a part of the Pokemon experience. Fortunately for me, I found some friends on Twitch. Now look, when I said I wasn't going to complete Scarlet and Violet for the aforementioned reasons, followers over on my Twitch channel said they would be more than willing to help me complete the Pokedex by trading me all the Pokemon they had already caught. Newly inspired by the kindness of strangers, aka internet friends, I decided to take things in a different direction. I gave myself the challenge to fully complete the Paldean Pokedex before I ever even went to school that starts the entire game. Not only that, but I made the commitment that it was going to be a living Dex. That means that I actually have to own physically one of each Pokemon entry in my bank, meaning I needed all 400 total Pokemon before I left the starting area. And I'm glad I did because the Pokemon introduced this generation are pretty awesome. Annihilate is this spectral evolution that Primeape has been needing for a long time. 
The new pseudo-legendary Baxcalibur is an icy Godzilla that is unfazed by fire. Cerulean and Armorage are basically Mega Man characters in a Pokemon game. And Flamingo is a Flamingo. That's your friend. That's pretty much it. There are tons of great punny names in Scarlet and Violet. A household of mice? That's Mousehold. A rockabilly parrot? Squawkabilly. An earthworm that eats ore? Orthworm. A dog made of dough? Fido. Freaking Fido. And it evolves into a fully cooked dachshund named Doxbin. They're all cute and I love them all. Getting all the Pokemon this early also gave me immediate access to the Pokedex. And I've got to say, this is the best Pokedex that a Pokemon game has had in a while, visually speaking. Instead of just being a list of names that you click on and read the entry with no pomp or circumstance, Scarlet and Violet's Pokedex actually feels like a library where you're scrolling through encyclopedias to get information about the Pokemon you're looking up. Each entry also comes with an awesome visual of the Pokemon in their natural habitat, as opposed to just the sprite of the Pokemon. This 100% captures the idea and nature of gotta catch them all, and will turn any casual fan into a completionist. Now I know the people out there who aren't going to say that I didn't actually catch them all. I had grunt people do all the work for me. First of all, my audience is the best, and they offered to do this for me, not the other way around. On top of that, I already have a comprehensive list of Pokemon that I own living deck style in Pokemon Home and have been creating a living decks for every generation of game I've previously completed. I can already fill up most of the Paladin decks with no issue. And truth be told, as Pokemon Home becomes more popular and they start integrating more and more new Pokemon games with it, I'm pretty much set for life in the future of Pokemon as a franchise. Also, I had to trade for all 400 of these Pokemon. That means I still had to catch 400 Pokemon in order to trade them for the Pokemon I needed. So I had to scour the opening area in order to get all the trading fodder I could. Fortunately, there was actually a decent amount to explore right at the very beginning of the game. You could just follow the path into Los Platos, the first town, and then head to the academy. Or you could wander the nearby hills and fields as much as you'd like. If you choose the latter like I did, you'll be introduced to a new whole ecosystem that includes woodlands, swampy ponds, ancient ruins, and even some caves if you're feeling particularly adventurous. There's even trainers for you to battle and, of course, dozens upon dozens of Pokemon for you to encounter. Much like the wild area in Sword and Shield and everywhere in Pokemon Legends Arceus, Pokemon are no longer found in random encounters. They are meandering about and acting like actual real animals. And just like in Sword and Shield, it filled me with a sense of childlike wonder. You can wander through this area and catch Pokemon to your heart's content, ranging from old favorites like Azeril and Psyduck to newbies like Lechonk and Pommy. And each of these Pokemon can be found pretty much wherever you think they would. Flying types and rodent-like Pokemon were found in open fields. Some water types were near a creek while others made their homes in ponds. And Tarantula can get the hell away from me because I hate spiders. It wound up taking me about 15 hours to create my living deck, so I didn't have to worry about catching any more Pokemon for the rest of my time playing Scarlet and Violet. Now, is this how you, the viewer, would probably complete the Pokedex? God, no. No, no one would. I'm dumb. But then again, you don't have access to an army of people who like your work. They like it a lot. They like it so much that they're willing to sacrifice their own Pokemon for your own personal gain. And why shouldn't they? I'm the completionist. I am a gaming god. So bring your precious babies and sacrifice them upon the completion altar and bask in my bearded glory. <laughs> No, but seriously, I wanted to say thank you to everyone on Twitch who helped me out with this entire process. There are way too many of you to name off the top of my head, but know that I am deeply grateful. I could not have done it without you. Oh, and to all of you non-believers out there, uh, don't worry. With every Pokemon caught and accounted for, I still have to do everything else in the game. And trust me, that's where the real fun actually begins. Hey, are you going to PAX East? I am going to be there. Me too. Hey, Categorist, you want to do a live show with me? No. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Come join Categorist and myself in a legendary night over at PAX East, March 26th on Sunday over at the Sonya Live Music Event Venue. Come on by. Tickets go on sale 
this Friday. And hey, you get some fun stuff if you show up, especially if you get those VIP packages. Hey, Caddy, tell them what they get. They get to hang out with us and then take some pictures and get some exclusive merch and then hang out with us again before the show starts and it'll be great. Awesome, it will be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. Come to a legendary night with the completionist and Cat Icarus for a big, fun variety stand-up show of laughter and good times at the Sonya Live Music Venue, Sunday night, March 26th. Tickets go on sale this Friday. It'll be great! So having collected every single Pokemon that Paldia has to offer, it's time to go to school. And like most schools, part of the curriculum consists of the entire student body wandering a whole country unaccompanied by adults. This is called the treasure hunt, and it initiates the thing that makes Scarlet and Violet, what someone would say, raison d'etre, exploring the open world. Remember when I mentioned how fun it was exploring everything the opening area had to offer? Now apply that to the entire region. There are a lot of different forests, mountains, caves, seas, and more that all look roughly the same to explore. Just so long as you don't go into the Forbidden Giant Crater at the end of the Paldia region that no one is allowed to go in ever, 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 no questions asked. Spoiler alert, you are absolutely going to go there someday. Normally speaking, this would mean that there are now more Pokemon to find, but I was already done with that. So what can motivate me, a well-established Pokemon master, to explore everything that Paldia had to offer? Honestly, the story. The plot of a Pokemon game is not normally its strong point. Collect the gym badges, prevent an evil team from committing atrocities, beat the Pokemon League, become the best in the world, and go back home to say hi to your single mother that you ditched at the beginning of the game. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet boasts one of the strongest overall stories in the franchise. Now before we move on, it's hard to talk about the story without talking about the story. So that means, yes, there will be spoilers here. There's spoilers in the title, so I'm assuming that you guys knew that going into this. If you have not beaten the game yet and you want to experience all this for yourself, know that I love the story and I highly recommend you play through it. After you go to your first day at the Academy, Director Clavel sends the entire student body on the annual treasure hunt, where each student searches for their own individual treasure. For you, the plot is split into the aforementioned three sections, Victory Road, Starfall Street, and the Path of Legends. Let's start with Victory Road. This is your standard Pokemon affair, where you collect all eight gym badges, beat the Elite Four, and become a champion, all while having a rival. Only this time, there's a bit of a catch. Your rival joins you on this journey, Nimona. Except this student council president also loves to battle and is already a champion. In Paldia, champion is no longer a title held by a single person. Instead, it's a rank that technically anyone can obtain. So it's more of an assessment of your battle skills than a challenge to see who's the best of the best. This is all run by Gita, who has the title of top champion because her job is to run the entire Pokemon League, including gym leaders, the Elite Four, and Pokemon League reps. The gym leaders in Scarlet and Violet are awesome. Their battles don't have the same excitement as Sword and Shield stadiums do, but each of their personalities more than make up for that. There's a girl who's an influencer and live streamer, a geriatric rapper, an exhausted office worker who had to pull double duty as a gym leader and an Elite Four member. Larry, I can relate, buddy. On the topic of the Elite Four, they're not quite as impressive. Each of the characters are interesting and well-designed, but they aren't difficult. All you need to defeat most of them is a single type. And for having rank of top champion, Gita is pretty easy. She's not a walk in the park by any means, but she's nowhere near the level of Cynthia. All of these battles serve as a great way to show off this generation's new mechanic, terastalization. I'm gonna ruin that name and amongst many other things, but I believe it's called terastalization. Every Pokemon in Paldia has the ability to terastalize, a silly sounding word that means that they they can change their type with the push of a button. This also gives the Pokemon a same type attack bonus or stab for that typing while still giving stab for its previous types. Alternatively, if a Pokemon has the same Terra type as its regular typing, it gets an additional boost. Sounds confusing? Because it is. Here's an example. In your battle with Iano, her final Pokemon is Miss Magus, a ghost type Pokemon, despite her being an electric gym leader. However, once she transmorphizes it, Miss Magus becomes an electric type, which pairs perfectly with its high special attack stat and the ability Levitate. In a similar vein, Larry Tetarizes his Staraptor into a normal type. Since it's already part normal, Tara reading it makes its normal type attacks do two times damage instead of one and a half times. But Tyrannosaurus 
Zora's Rexification isn't the only change to Pokemon battles, since they no longer start once you make eye contact with another trainer. Instead, you have to actually walk up to them and talk to a trainer. I gotta say, it's much nicer to walk up to someone and request a fight than to be ambushed by some random hiker in a cave. It's easy enough to get through the game without engaging in any of these normal battles. However, Game Freak does motivate you by putting 19 different Battle League reps across Paldia. If you defeat a certain number of trainers, they will give you a reward. It's an effective way to get you to actually seek out these random trainers. So next up, we have Starfall Street, where you take on Scarlet and Violet's evil team, Team Star. You're introduced to them after you stop them from recruiting a shy classmate, Penny. Soon after your treasure hunt begins, your Rotom phone gets hacked by someone named Cassiopeia. They recruit you, Penny, and a 100% totally normal student that is not an old man who happens to be the director of the school, Director Clavel, named Clive, into destroying Team Star. This means defeating all five of Team Star's leaders at their bases. To initiate these, you have to defeat a Grunt, ring a bell, and then you must send out three Pokemon of your own to roam around and defeat 30 opponents on their own in 10 minutes time. This may sound like a lot, but it's actually incredibly easy. What isn't as easy is defeating each of the team's leaders afterwards. Each one works kind of as a gym leader, except their ace is a souped up car powered up by the new Pokemon, Revavroom. These things can be rough if you come at them at too low of a level, even if you do have a type advantage. That being said, it definitely feels more unique from most of the boss fights in the Pokemon series. Once they're defeated, you get a flashback to when Team Star was formed. It turns out that now they appear as bullies, but they were actually formed to protect themselves from other school bullies. Essentially, they were a bunch of dorky theater kids who had social issues, and they all joined forces to take on the people that threatened them. This led to them being ostracized, but it also led to a deeper connection. In my opinion, this makes Team Star one of the most empathetic evil teams Pokemon has ever had. They may not be trying to summon a literal devil or flood the earth, but these are just a bunch of kids trying to deal with problems when adults won't help them. And personally speaking, I know a bunch of people who have gone through similar things. This is also when we get to interact with our third rival, Penny. It turns out, Director Clavel isn't the only person in disguise. Cassiopeia, your guide and founder of Team Star, has actually been Penny all along. After Team Star became known as bullies themselves, she knew that they had to be dissolved, and the only way to do that was by defeating them in battle. You now have to face her, and after you win, Team Star is done for good. This is kind of a surprisingly tough topic for Pokemon to tackle. Normally, the ideas are bigger and more generalized, like saving the environment is good and crime is bad. With Starfall Street, we're now looking at bullying and where these bullies come from. This is normally something you'd see in an after-school special, but Scarlet and Violet handle it surprisingly well. You even get to see Director Clavel admit he handled things poorly and use the rules and skills of Team Star to help other students. It's actually quite refreshing to see this topic handled so well. Finishing out our story trio is the Path of Legends, where you join Arvin in battling giant Titan Pokemon to find rare herbs to make fancy sandwiches. And despite how stupid that sounds, this is my favorite storyline amongst the three. This section has you mainly working with Arvin and either Professor Sada or Professor Turo, depending on whether you're playing Scarlet or Violet. The very beginning of the game, you hear a cry on the beach below you and you see the box legendary for your version. Coridon for Scarlet and Miraidon for Violet, lying there injured on the floor. You go down and help and work together to escape a cave infested with Hondor. Once you reach the top, you meet Arvin, who actually has the Pokeball for said legendary. He insults you and challenges you to a battle. After you wipe the floor with him, he gives you the Pokeball and the corresponding Pokemon quickly becomes the most useful Pokemon in the game because it is your mount. As you complete these missions and Arvin makes his sandwiches for you, Koraiden and Miraiden will gain additional abilities to help you move around the area, including swimming, gliding, climbing, and jumping even higher. Now, look, this is great for traversing the landscape, but it's Arvin's story that makes this storyline so interesting. Believe it or not, Arvin isn't just making sandwiches for the sake of making sandwiches. The professor is Arvin's parent, and they have been negligent towards Arvin, focusing more on their own research than him. This means he only had one real friend growing up, his Mabostiff, a Mastiff-like dog Pokemon. 
Unfortunately, it has gotten deathly ill and no medicine has been helpful. Arvin feels that his only hope is to seek out the Herba Mystica and use that to try and heal his poor dog. Longtime fans of the show know that I have two dogs, Boofy and Yayo. Recently, uh, I have known the unfortunate pain of dealing with a sick dog. Um, Boofy got uh, melanoma, skin cancer, and uh, I'm happy to say that he's doing well. Uh, we took care of him and he's doing great. He's an old pup, we love him to death, and he's still a part of our family, and he still will be. He's in good health for now. Um, but there is nothing more in the world that you want to do other than take care of your, your best friend, your parents, your loved one, or your dog to make sure that they get better. And if I was in the same predicament that Arvin was in, I would do the exact same thing. So even though Arvin started out as a real jackass, I completely get where he's coming from. I love my Boofy boy, and Arvin loves his dog too. And we share that connection, which is why it makes this storyline some of the best storytelling in the Pokemon franchise. What's especially great about these storylines is that all of these missions are scattered around the map in a non-linear fashion. On top of this, some missions are easier than others. You can't just plow through every single one of these in a row just to get it done. You have to figure out which of these challenges you can actually beat at the moment. Yes, you can start at the hardest gym, but you'll probably get pulverized. A lot of people have complained about this, saying that it's not really an open world game since these challenges don't scale with your progress. But I disagree here. Every single one of these elements is meant to tell the story that Scarlet and Violet want to tell. Plus, this encourages you to explore more of the region. If all the challenges are too difficult on one side of the map, why not try the other? Maybe there's something easier over there. But Gerard, I hear you say. You can just plow through all of these because you have all the most powerful Pokemon. Well, there's actually a workaround for that. I can't get to every gym, Titan, and Fortress right away because I haven't gotten my mount upgraded all the way yet. It's almost impossible to get some of these locations because of that. Also, I have to honor the level cap. When you start the game, Pokemon up to level 20 will obey you no problem. However, if they're a higher level, they will be more likely to flat out ignore your commands. So in order to get through the game, I still had to level up a competent team. And when I say I have a very bizarre team, my friends, I went out of my way to make a very bizarre team. For Scarlet, my final team wound up being a Shiny Annihilate, Hydreigon, Houndstone, Ceruleage, a Shiny Azumarill, and Mousehold. I chose a lot of these because they looked cool, especially Annihilate and Ceruleage. But the biggest surprise that I had in my back pocket was Mousehold. It's literally just a household of mice, but it's incredibly fast and can learn Population Bond. And with the wide lens, it's a move that can guarantee your opponent gets hit 10 times. It's messed up, it's broken, it's badass, hell yeah. In Violet, I took a different approach and chose Pokemon that I wouldn't normally use. Kill a Watchroll, Tinkatin, Scovillian, Clodsire, Rapska, and the Aqua-bred Tauros became my team of choice. Here, Tauros and Tinkatin pulled a ton of the weight. I don't know if any of these teams were optimal, but man oh man was it fun to get weird. At the end of the game, after you've become champion, dissolved the team star, and brought Mabistiff back to health, all three stories connect and wrap up the entire Scarlet and Violet experience into a nice bow by sending you and your three friends into the great crater of Paldia, the only place people aren't allowed to go ever, 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 no questions asked. Once you get into the crater, you learn that most of the Pokemon there are different. These are Paradox Pokemon, who are either from the prehistoric past or the very distant future, depending on whether you're playing Scarlet or Violet respectively. All of these Pokemon resemble Pokemon that already exist, but the difference is being that they're way stronger and their names are way more dumb. Instead of awesome punny names we got earlier, all of these are just two word descriptions. Seriously, just listen to some of these right now. Brute Bonnet, Fluttermane, Screamtail. But despite the stupid names, I think Paradox Pokemon are a great idea overall that I can't wait to see explored more in future games. The deeper you get into the crater, the more you learn about the expedition that went on there long ago, led by Professor Sada slash Turo. They were trying to use the power of the crater to travel to the past slash future, but everything went wrong slash wrong. 
It turns out that the professor was sent to their respective desired times, but has been unable to return and is probably dead. The person contacting you is actually an AI that is meant to control the time machine so that the Paradox Pokemon don't overrun the Paldean ecosystem as well as protect the time machine so that no one can destroy it. Game Freak, what the f This Pokemon game took a hard turn from dealing with complex relationships at school to tragic sci-fi really quickly. It does kind of answer the questions regarding why your rivals were treated so poorly. Why didn't the adults step in to help Team Star? Because they were busy dealing with this time machine thing. Why didn't Arvin's parents talk to him? They were in a completely different time period. Also, Nimona's there too. This is a wild choice to make that I definitely did not see coming and I kind of love it. Uh, every other Pokemon professor has served as a guiding hand on a young child's journey to catch lovable creatures. Sada and Turo are actually an evil AI that is threatening to destroy you. But I guess that was the whole point of the treasure hunt. You weren't actually looking for valuable items. The real treasure was friendship and using that friendship to stop a mysterious power that was being hidden by the government. Basically, this is Pokemon Stranger Things, and that is motivation enough for me. But there's also motivation of that classic video game treasure, collectibles. Beyond an exceptional story, there needs to be smaller innovations along the way to keep the player enticed. For most, the Pokemon roaming the very bland landscapes would be motivation enough, but I knocked that aspect out at the start. Fortunately, Scarlet and Violet excels with plenty of additional items scattered everywhere. There are many different collectible items throughout all of Paldia, serving as a great way to make you go, ooh, I wanna grab that. Whether they appear as a Pokeball or just as a golden shimmer on the ground, you know that I had to stop wherever I was going and pick that thing up. Most of these items are just helpful tools to give to your Pokemon to heal them or make them stronger, but there are three that are more important for completion. TMs, Ruinous Stakes, and Gimme a Ghoul Coins. TM, as always, stands for Technical Machine, and they appear as yellow Pokeballs as opposed to the more common red ones. These are used to teach your Pokemon to move instantly, but break after a single use. It's important to collect as many of these as possible, since once you find it, you will forever have this recipe to make your own TMs. This is a new feature for Scarlet and Violet. In order to craft these, you have to harvest the ingredients by defeating certain Pokemon. You can engage in battle with them normally. However, this is long and tedious. Fortunately, Scarlet and Violet introduce a new mechanic called Let's Go Mode, which has nothing to do with Let's Go Pikachu or Eevee, despite the similar name. With the push of the right shoulder button, the Pokemon at the front of your party will rush out of its Pokeball and attack any of the wild Pokemon near it. If it has a level or type advantage, it will vanquish its foe with ease. This is not only a great way to get TM ingredients, but to quickly level weaker Pokemon as well. Despite what they sound like, the ruinous stakes are not the remnants of decrepit cows. There are 32 long poles left in the ground in different quadrants around Paldia. If you gather eight of the same color, you will open a gate that gives you access to one of the four treasures of ruin, ancient Pokemon that are the personification of the hatred, fear, and envy of a king. To put it mundanely, they're Scarlet and Violet's version of a legendary trio. The last item you run around and collect are Gimme a Ghoul coins. Gimme a Ghoul is a tiny Pokemon that is so fast, it's normally impossible to catch. If you see one out in the wild, approach it and it will run away, dropping a coin or two behind it. However, there is another form of Gimme a Ghoul that lives in a chest that are much slower and will defend their horde. If you catch or defeat them, you will earn a lot more coins. Now, if you collect 999 of these Gimme a Ghoul coins, you can evolve your Gimme a Ghoul into Golden Ego, a golden string cheese man who follows you on a snowboard made of coins. Technically, I did not have to collect all of these since I already had a Golden Go, but I couldn't help myself from collecting these little guys every single time I saw them. Now, the story motivated me to explore Paldi in the long run, but it was these collectibles that had an immediate effect on me. If I saw any of these items, I had to get them as soon as possible. Just like coins in Mario or rings in Sonic, they were that quick boost of serotonin that I needed. And to be frank, I really needed that motivation because the technical aspects of the game were really just bringing me down. Scarlet and Violet has problems. 
Fans have demanded refunds due to numerous glitches, performance issues, and game crashes. Hell, across my own playthroughs of Scarlet and Violet, my game crashed at least six times, and this was all after a day one patch. Crashes are not the only issues I experienced. In the beginning, when I was trading all the Pokemon, online communication would often just end, even though I had the right code and both parties had great internet connections. When you would approach slopes, textures are loaded in to adjust to how you're viewing them, which is weird and unsettling. There are also massive load times that actually made me want to stop playing. But the most notable problem lies with how slowly everything moves. There are two major examples that I can point out. The first is when you get to Artisan. There's a huge windmill in the center that would be a very cool set piece, except that it only moves like a windmill when you get very close to it. From slightly further away, it moves like a ticking clock. Then there's your homeroom class with Jock. Jack? I don't know, I have a brother named Jock, so it's hard for me to read that name. There are so many kids in that class that the frame rate plummets. These children move like animatronics on an old amusement park and it is creepy as hell. Now this specific problem is most obvious in these two occasions, but you'll be noticing them throughout the game with people and Pokemon in the not so distant distance. Some people are pointing to the weak power of the Nintendo Switch as the main source of these problems, but that doesn't make sense to me. There are plenty of other games like Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and Breath of the Wild that have never gotten these types of complaints, and if they did, the patches that came out were right away immediate and took care of the problems for the most part. Breath of the Wild was a launch title, but there's one thing that those teams had the developers at Pokemon Scarlet and Violet did not seem to have. Time. It's obvious that the development team did not have enough time to optimize performance, let alone to get the game to work proper. These technical pain points are far from the only things I take umbrage with. There are others that, from a design standpoint, are just plain lazy. The wilderness has potential to both be exciting and inviting, but with a lack of visual distinction or a notable landmark, everything feels alarmingly the same. Look, I'm gonna ruin all these names, I'm gonna try and get through them all, okay, here we go. The towns also leave a lot to be desired. A majority of them have impressive elements, like the waterfalls of Kaskarafa, the ghostly ambience of Montana Venera, and the nostalgic tidal work of Alfernada. But every town and city generally feels kind of empty. Part of this is because you can only go into buildings that are shops or have narrative significance. Every other structure is just a facade for you to look at. Compare this to previous Pokemon games where you could go into every single building, whether they were useful or not. This may not have been necessary, but it made the cities feel like cities. As the completionist, you know that I checked every single one of these damn doors because who knows which one was actually hiding a secret for me to find. You wanna know the answer? None of them had a secret for me to find. The people walking about don't help either. If you walk by them, they'll make a generic statement like, I love Pokemon, or I'm tired. This makes them feel more like guests to your theme park and roller coaster tycoon than the populace of a major city. Even a bustling metropolis like Mesagosa feels empty because all of these people just seem fake. Speaking of talking about these people, what is up with the trainer classes? In previous games, trainer classes added variety to your encounters and let you know what type of Pokemon you were going to face. That, for the most part, is gone in Scarlet and Violet. There is your occasional Dragon Tamer or Pokemaniac, but a majority of the trainers you face will just be students. And most of these students are kids and teenagers. But there are also some that are obviously middle-aged or senior citizens. This is funny a few times, but when it starts happening in the double digits, it seems a little bit lazy. You're an adult. You shouldn't be going on your own Pokemon journey at this point. I should know. I'm in my mid-30s, for God's sakes. Even the music, something Pokemon usually excels at, felt a bit more scattered in terms of quality, both for setting the tone of a location or a battle, but here, things aren't meshing. Towns lack any clear musical distinction or motifs, and oftentimes battles felt discordant to their surroundings. Even raid battles and whenever a gym leader transmorphosizes their Pokemon, which are some of the highlights here, sadly feel like a lazier copy-paste from Sword and Shield than something that was meaningfully worked towards. Scarlet and Violet could have had so much more life breathed into them if the people making the game were given more time. I talked a lot about the various problems that these games have, but I've only begun to scratch the surface. It's clear that the Pokemon company is trying to maximize profits by releasing as many big games as possible. Within a year, we got Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, Legends Arceus, and now Scarlet and Violet. All three of these games have technical and quality of life problems. For the next games, for the love of God, take your time game free. Give us more than three years to make that game that will truly blow us out of the water. We will wait. 
I will wait. We, some of us can wait, okay? We'll figure it out. Take your time. Pokemon games have always nailed post-game content. Not only do you normally have to finish catching every Pokemon, but there is something like a battle tower to really challenge everything you know about the game. And there was plenty for me to do after I solved the mystery of the great creator of Paldia, but I can't say that all of it was exciting as previous games. First off for me was the classes at the Academy. You know, the place that sent you into the world the way Ms. Frizzle takes her class on the field trips. There are actual classes for you to attend. These are basic tutorials that teach you about in-game mechanics and facts about Paldia. Taking these classes provides you with a basic reward as well as side missions you can do within the school for teachers in order to get to know them better. And of course, get even more stuff. There's a decent balance between interesting and boring ones, with my personal highlight being the home ec teacher. I did these after I beat the game, but you can actually finish most of them during the main story, and I would recommend doing so. The items are very helpful for difficult battles. Teachers are also involved in the next post-game activity, the Academy Ace Tournament. Organized by Nimona and the top champion, Gita, this tournament serves as a place for you to battle the faculty and your student rivals. But in order to get this started, you must also have to rematch every single gym leader. They have stronger teams and will provide some challenge, but all of this is easy if you have created a well-balanced team or have enough gumption to get through with the team of your favorites like I did. Now, all of this is fairly standard and isn't that challenging. If you played a Pokemon game before, you can get through these no problem. What drove me nuts was the sandwiches. Remember those things that Arvin kept making for you in your mount? Well, you have to make them for yourself, and making sandwiches was easily the most tedious part of completing Scarlet and Violet. Throughout the game, you can have a picnic with your Pokemon where they can roam around, play, make eggs. Gross. This is also the place where you can make different sandwiches that affect the world around you. So for example, if I wanted to catch an Aqua variant Tauros for my Violet playthrough, I would need to make a sandwich that would increase the likelihood of finding said Tauros. So I would eat a sandwich that would increase the encounter rate of either water or fighting type Pokemon until I found this rarer Pokemon. These sandwiches can influence lots of things like egg rate, the size of your Pokemon encounter, and your chances at catching a type of Pokemon. The problem was I already had every single Pokemon and didn't need to catch or breed for more. I had to get every sandwich recipe just for the sake of having every sandwich recipe. And for whatever reason, there were 151 of them. Getting most of these was pretty easy. Go into the sandwich shop, talk to the man standing next to the counter. He'll give you a majority of the recipes. The problem was that there are still a ton that I did not have. From what I understood, there was only one way to obtain these recipes. Discover them myself in creative mode. So I did what any smart person would do in the situation and pulled up a list online and started checking off the ones I already obtained. This then added another frustrating layer to this process. For a bunch of these sandwiches, I needed the different Herbamisticas, the same rare herbs that Arvin had me hunting on the Path of Legends. Except I couldn't just go back to those locations and get them myself. I'd have to go somewhere else. Terror Raids. Now, Terror Raids replace the Dynamax Raids from Sword and Shield, but pretty much they operate the same way. The Pokemon your team is fighting has a unique Terra type it would normally not have, and it's up to all of you on the team to whittle its HP down to capture it. This grants a lot of extra items, including the Herbamisticas. Terra Raids are fun if you're looking for a specific Pokemon or are taking part in one of the weekly event raids that have rare Pokemon in them like Cinderace or Charizard, but if you're just farming for a bunch of herbs, they're not interesting. It becomes laborious just to get through these things because I had to take on the higher level five, six, seven star Terra raids in order to guarantee that I would get the Herbamistica. It became less fun and more work, which should never be the case for a game like this. But the worst part of the sandwiches is that they aren't fun to make. All you do is place fillings on bread with very bad physics, usually making your food fall off or slide to the side. It's like I'm playing a bad mobile game here. Compare this to making poffins or curry from previous Pokemon games. Yes, these aren't really necessary, but at least they can be entertaining. Overall, the post game of Scarlet and Violet was mediocre. Rematching gym leaders and battling the teachers is cool and all, but none of these were really on the same level as any of the Battle Tower-esque challenges from previous games. It's not bad, but none of it really blows me away. Making sandwiches kinda sucks. It's not fun, and I know it has its uses, but do we really need 151 different recipes again? I feel like this is a scenario where less would have been a lot more. I don't know why Game Freak is insisting on putting cooking in their games, but honestly, it's not for me. If I want to spend hours making sandwiches, I'd play Cooking Mama. Or get a job at Jersey Mike's. Which, shout out to Jersey Mike's. I love Jersey Mike's. There's nothing wrong with Jersey Mike's, right, everyone? 
Nothing's ad wrong with Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's. This, this is an ad. ad. This is not an ad. This is, an ad. This is not an ad. Just don't want. It could be an ad. It could be an ad. It Jersey, could be. Jersey Mike. Jersey if you work at Jersey Mike's, shout it to me on Twitter. I'll give you a digital high five. And Jersey Mike's corporate, give us money. Game Freak was kind of smart with Pokemon Scarlet and Violet since almost every element is meant to get you to explore all of the Paldea region. Seeing all the different Pokemon and items on the ground is exciting and collecting them gave me the will to keep playing even though I already caught every Pokemon. When I saw the first 32 ruinous stakes, I didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to do it. And the reward for powerful Pokemon would have been well worth it if I hadn't already got them at the very beginning of my journey. It's the same with any of the items I see on the ground. I would run to grab them, whether they were just a berry or one of the 171 TMs I needed to get. Even completing the Pokedex constantly rewards you with more items to help you catch and evolve even more Pokemon. Now, obviously, the biggest Pokedex reward comes in the form of the shiny charm, an item that makes rare shiny variants of Pokemon appear more frequently. There is a whole group of Pokemon fans dedicated to that, so I'll let them tell you all about it. But it is nice to get a shiny Pokemon and give it to your girlfriend. The only thing that did not feel rewarding was getting all 151 sandwich recipes, because by the time I got them all, I definitely didn't even need them. These can all be useful for completing your Pokedex, breeding, and shiny hunting, but I had already either done that or had no interest in doing any of that. Some of that could have been on me, but the process was just more checking off a list than actually exploring anything. Please, let's leave the cooking to Pokemon Cafe Remix. In my total of about 180 hours of playing Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, most of this was thoroughly enjoyable. What wasn't was dealing with all the technical issues that ran rampant throughout my playthroughs. I wanted a different experience when playing Scarlet and Violet. Having finished the Pokedex ahead of time may have been a mistake to some when it comes to enjoying everything with these games that they have to offer, but I don't think it had that much of an effect on me. I still had a blast. The enjoyable aspects were still delightful, and the frustrating elements would have still graded on me a fair amount. Structurally speaking, Scarlet and Violet are a step in the right direction for the Pokemon series. The open world encourages exploration, the main story is a standout for recent Pokemon games, and there are more than enough things to do to keep most people entertained for a while. But these games are far from perfect. Gameplay would slow down until animations moved at what felt like one frame per second. Load times take forever. And there are some towns that are just dead ass empty. Scarlet and Violet are fun, but they're not done. They could have easily used another year in development, and I hope that people in charge at Game Freak take that to heart for their next title. I personally think that you should play Scarlet and Violet, at least until you get through the story. At that point, play until the technical garbage gets to be too much for you. And skip the sandwiches, you probably won't need them. And it's because of that, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it.